First of all, I'd like to thank very much the uh, introduction by Meta Spencer and in particular this opportunity for the freedom of expression, freedom of speech and freedom of expression, which is rather rare in my circumstances. Uh, usually I have to travel to some other country in order to uh, be able to speak at a conference. There are very few opportunities to speak about this subject and on the subject of Palestine from a Jewish perspective and not a Zionist perspective, is very rare here in Canada. Less rare in Quebec, but in Canada it is still a problem. I'll explain the confusion behind the problem as well. Now, there has to be a certain clarification by means of a differentiation of various concepts in order to be able to get a handle on what the, the problem or the problematic is in discussing Israel and in discussing the Palestinians, in particular the Palestinian refugees. We have the nation state concept which was invented to resolve the problems presented by the European uh, nations that existed under the Holy Roman Empire and sought their independence and their democratic will on a national basis, on a cultural basis, rather than a religious uh, hegemony imposed by uh, another country which was basically the Roman Empire which transformed itself into the Holy Roman Empire and sought to maintain its legitimacy as such. However, that was contested by the Protestant Reformation, inspired by the Renaissance, which found its roots in the Torah, in the Jewish Torah, which was a forbidden fruit to the Catholic uh, members uh, of the church at the time, and only the clergy were allowed to actually read the, uh, the Old Testament, as it uh, came to be called, and as it was embellished with a number of other chapters. So the Protestant nation-state concept came into existence with the Treaty of Westphalia in 1648 and considered itself to be the epitome of the logical conclusion of historical evolution, the Hegelian sort of, you know, um, uh, that which exists is in itself a rationale of its own existence. That is, since it had come into existence in various uh, uh, locales, you know, with Lutheranism in Germany, with Calvinism in Holland, with Anglicanism in England, etc., and the Huguenots in, in France, who were not as fortunate as the other tendencies. Um, this was considered to be the logical evolution of uh, political existence. The existence of a nation sought its existence, its rationale, as a nation-state concept. Now the critique of the nation-state goes beyond you know, the anarchist critique of the state itself, which is valid in its own manner, but the nation-state has a further uh, existence which is associated with nationalism, which is based upon mm -hmm. national identity and is uh, slid over and obscures the national identity of a people to claim that identity in its own name, that is, in the name of the state, which is, of course, coinciding with the rising of the national bourgeoisie, establishing its own state structure, its own independence, and its own sovereign authority, and usually its own imperialism as well, to top it off. And this is all comprised in the theory of nationalism and in the modern school of nationalism and its rationale. However, this obscures the national identity of various peoples. Not only the majoritarian uh, nation that exists, you know, subsumed by the nationalism of a given nation state, but also the various national minorities which exist within that nation state and which have their own national identity independently of any state and independently, usually, of a nationalist ideology. However, in the case of the Jewish people after the Holocaust in particular, this national identity was given expression 
by the nationalist Tennessee, which was founded by Herzl in 1897, called Zionism, because it was oriented towards the hill Zion, the Zion Hill, it's not even a mountain, upon which the, uh, the old temple was built and upon which the Alexa Mosque is now built. So it became associated with a particular territorial site, a physical site, which became the center of the ambitions of the Zionist movement to establish a state in its own name and in the name of the Jewish people, even though, as it turns out now, we can see that the majority of the Jewish people don't even live in the state of Israel, do not want to live in the state of Israel, and may, to some degree or another, sympathize with the state of Israel, in particular with the Jewish Israeli population, but do not see themselves as being obliged to go and learn Hebrew and go and live in the state of Israel and become Zionist or to send their children there either. They find that living in a pluralistic society as uh, Western uh, nation states are evolving to become with difficulty to be preferable to living within a nationalistic inclined environment in isolation from other cultures and which can best be described as separatism, which is that nasty word that's used to describe, you know, the Parti Québécois and, um, and to diss the uh, nationalist aspirations of the Québécois people because they want to separate from us good folk here in Ontario. Okay. Now, it's true that separatism has this uh, nasty implication to it, that is, uh, dissociating itself from other cultures, uh, seeking isolation, and in fact, this is actually mentioned by one of the founders, theoretical founders of the Zionist movement, Jabotinsky, who called for the separation principle as the basis of Zionism. Now, of course, this is entirely incompatible with the population of Palestine as it existed in 1948. And so the Zionists, in order to achieve their separation principle, then went through a number of massacres in each village approximately 75 Palestinians were killed in each village, which induced the rest of the village to flee in panic. And the best known such village is Deir Yassin, but there's uh, 400 such um, cases which are not known about. When did this happen? 48. 47. Actually, it started in 1947. And the uh, plan that the Zionist militias had, which included all the Zionist militias, including the labor Zionist militias, the leftists, the socialist Zionists, was called Plan Dalit. Dalit means fourth. It's the uh, Hebrew word for the number four. So it's the fourth plan. And it was um, not, you know, uh, some rogue elements or one particular, you know, Zionist militia that carried out these massacres. It was the Palmach, the major Zionist militia at the time, which carried out these massacres in the name of establishing a state. Not for the liberation of the Jewish people but for the purposes of, of establishing a state apparatus with a military uh, hegemony over a population which was um, ostracized, uh, segregated, ghettoized, expelled, and uh, the refugees were not allowed to return. And those that did attempt to return, of them, uh, 5,000 were killed. They were called infiltrators you know, uh, refugees without arms who came back, who were trying to come back to their villages. And, uh, and uh, that uh, process of the return of the refugees in 48 was stopped by, um, by massacre again. Now, alongside um, uh, national identity, we have, you know, uh, what's called a people. Now, I would refer to the various Jewish communities around the world as a people. So what I'm doing here is I'm defining the, you know, the parameters of discussion so we can you know, proceed you know, with some analysis. Now, a Jewish people comp is comprised of various Jewish nations. There is the Ashkenazi Jewish nation, which are the European Jewish peoples, half of whom were speaking Yiddish, like myself. Yichad Yiddish, and Yiddish, Yiddish. So Yiddish, you know, is one of the major constituents, you know, of the Ashkenazi culture. And uh, then there's the Sephardim who come, who were expelled from Spain and went to the Arab countries, mainly Morocco, Turkey, 
Algeria, etc. And the Arab Jewish population are another nation in and of itself, Sephardim, who spoke Arab, Arabic as a principal language. And of course, you know, Hebrew was the uh, litur liturgical language, the language with which um, Jewish people would uh, go to pray with, something like Latin. But it wasn't an oral language. It wasn't a language used to speak in daily conversation. It was either Yiddish or the, um, the Jews of um, Germany and France spoke uh, the local language. Even though Yiddish is a German dialect, German itself is, has a distinct character to itself, and the German Jewish population spoke that in preference to Yiddish, which was considered to be a lower class language, which in fact it was. My parents count from the, uh, the working class, the mass working class Jewish population of Eastern Europe, who were uh, the lower stratum of the working class, not the aristocracy of the working class, uh, as, uh, as the, uh, uh, the, ma the majority nation, you know, uh, took that position in each of the countries. And, uh, and they uh, formed a movement which called Bund, the Bundist movement, which means basically union or alliance. And it was comprised of both a uh, Jewish political party and a, uh, a syndicalist movement. Uh, something like the anarcho-syndicalist movement, the IWW, but it was based upon a national basis because the, uh, the, the Polish uh, organizations, for instance, you know, were not hospitable to the Jewish uh, population. Uh, and, uh, and so the, the Jewish workers formed their own organization. And uh, this uh, turned into a contradiction with the, uh, the hegemonic uh, conception of the working class that was imposed upon the Second International by the Marxist parties, which then led to the 1903 expulsion of the Jewish Bund from the Second International. And uh, so there was this uh, a major sort of a difference imposed upon the political culture of the Jewish people at that time by the Marxist tendencies, which uh, served to alienate the Jewish people from the uh, Marxist tendencies. And in fact, uh, the Jewish Bund was suppressed even after the revolution of 1917 in Russia, when the two Jewish Bundes leaders, uh, Erlecht and Alter, were imprisoned by Stalin for having started a uh, Jewish anti-fascist committee in 1939. That's how far the, uh, the differences between these two tendencies are. So the analysis that I'm, I'm presenting to you, uh, which is based upon the Jewish Bundes perspective, has very little to do with actually Marxist analysis, even though it is a socialist analysis. Now this is not a common sort of perception. Usually, you know, socialist analysis is considered to be Marxist, but in this case it is not. So, we come down to the question of how Zionism operates based upon the nation-state concept using what is called the principle of self-determination, which in liberal democratic theory is considered to be the norm. Each country is supposed to have its own self-determination and this is expressed as the majority um, democratic will of the population. Except that the majority of a population are usually of one nation and then you have all the minorities which do not have a majority by definition and so they are continually outvoted. And so the, the, the state becomes defined as nation in the name of the majority who comprise that nation. So the Zionists concluded that it was not possible to transform those countries from anything other than a nation state. They adopted the nation state concept as a paradigm and used it as a rationale to establish what they called, naturally, Jewish self-determination. Okay, so Jewish self-determination decreed that the Palestinians had to be expelled in order to form a majority population in that country. And that is precisely what they went ahead and did. Now, it's entirely, you know, rational from the perspective of liberal democratic theory. However, it is entirely in contradiction with the national liberation of any other people. So self-determination becomes a contradiction in itself because if 
uh, the Zionists claim self-determination in the name of the Jewish people, why cannot the Palestinians also claim self-determination in the name of the Palestinian people? If it is a principle, that is, if it is a principle that has to be respected by all concerned, even if they are not a member of that given nation. However, there is a contradiction in that principle, because one self-determination is contradicting the self-determination of another, especially when they occupy the same territory. And then, of course, there's all the wars in Europe, you know, that took place, one self-determination and one sovereignty contesting another sovereignty over all South Lorraine or, or whatever, you know, piece of territory that each, you know, different state claims for itself, leading to one war after another. So, eventually they began to realize in Europe that this concept of self-determination does not work and they're trying to sort of work out some sort of, you know, state federation called the European Union. Good luck, you know, based upon the state formations. However, when we have the two nations occupying the same territory, you have self-determination contradicting itself. So how you resolve this contradiction is with uh, what the Bund called national cultural autonomy. Autonomy means auto-determination. I use auto-determination in place of self-determination because of the contradiction, the internal contradiction within self-determination. And auto-determination seems to fit because it does not mean that auto-determination of one people contradicts the auto-determination of another people, because each people remain autonomous, but not sovereign, imposing its will upon another people, which is implied by self-determination. Now, the term auto-determination I, I borrow from French. In French, the term for self-determination is auto-determination, and I think it has a, a better meaning to it. In French, it has more precise political meaning, which does not contain that contradiction, which is propagated in English by the term self-determination. So I use auto-determination to describe the basis, the method by which national cultural autonomy is established. The Jewish Bund thought of the concept of national cultural autonomy as a means by which the Jewish minority in Poland could exist and coexist with the uh, Catholic Polish uh, population who are majoritarian and uh, got a, a good response from the Jewish community on this basis because the, the Polish Jewish community were Polish. There was no reason to think, you know, that they were not Polish. They were Polish, they spoke Polish in the home and everything like that. My parents, when they spoke to each other, they spoke in Polish. With me, they spoke in Yiddish. Maybe because they wanted to keep things secret from me, but <laughs> nonetheless, they were, of course, very Polish. And, uh, and the Jewish Polish uh, population contrib contributed a great deal to the uh, Polish culture, as is the case in any other context as well. The Jewish people are one of the first um, Oriental peoples to um, migrate into Europe for various reasons, beginning with the Roman Empire, into Rome, etc and uh, found it a hospitable, interesting place to live. And so they hung around and they, and they uh, became a minority culture with a dual identity. With auto-determination and national cultural autonomy, you can have more than one identity. This is the, the secret of pluralism, in that you um, do not have one hegemonic identity. You are not just an American, which is the standard, which is um, the, uh, the, uh, the political culture that is the most pertinent to, to this question. Uh, Americans are not just Americans, you know. Uh, Americans have origins from which they came from, because they weren't from America in the first place. They came from Europe. There were the British Americans, who are about 26% of the American population. Then there's the German Americans who are about 25% of the American population. And then there's about 16% African Americans and about 15% Latino Americans. So when you get into the nitty gritty of it, you know, a so sociological analysis of the population, demographic analysis, you find that people have more than one identity. And this is how the Jews were able to survive and exist. Now, the Inquisition in Spain would not tolerate such a dual identity, insisted upon only one identity, and forced many 
of the Jewish people who wanted to integrate into society to convert to Catholicism. They were called the conversos. However, during the Inquisition, they were accused of being um, uh, secret Jews. And they were prosecuted for that. And even though they had converted to, to Catholicism and raised their children as Catholics and were sincere in all respects, nonetheless, they were either executed or expelled from Spain by uh, Isabella and Fr Ferdinand. So that was one example of how the nation state would not tolerate a dual identity. The other big example, of course, is in Germany, which was the most civilized of the countries, which gave rise to the Holocaust, which again would not tolerate a national minority such as the Jewish people or the, uh, the Roma people, uh, also who were from the Orient. So any Oriental people were in particular considered to be uh, aliens. And, you know, the degree to which this type of mentality can go is illustrated by uh, Hegel himself, who, when he was con presented with the Treaty of Westphalia, complained that the unification of the German provinces was not to his liking because only Prussia was a pure enough German uh, culture to be considered Germany. The others were, you know, mixed or something like this, you know, and so they didn't count, you know, as much. But nonetheless, Germany was constituted, you know, with uh, all of its provinces. So, to actually try to implement the concept of a nation state from the year 1648 in the 20th century by the Zionist movement was a catastrophe and is a continuing catastrophe. This catastrophe was evident to many people at the time, such as President Truman, who wrote uh, who, his signature on a letter recognizing the uh, proclamation of the independence of the State of Israel. If I can find it here. You know, you have to provide evidence, you know, because this, this, topic, is, this topic is so... <coughs> This topic is so uh, controversial and so ideologicalized uh, that you have to actually demonstrate, you know, in physical form that the um, presumptions of the given ideology, that is Zionism, are based upon false premises. Okay, now here we have, this is the letter signed by Harry Truman in uh, 1948 recognizing the State of Israel. Okay? Now, what is indicative here, the historians who provided this, the librarians who provided this piece of evidence that I found, did not even notice something contained within this document, which is that in the last line there, you can see that there are two words that are crossed out. Those words are after uh, The de facto, the de facto authority of the, then it had been typed, a Jewish state. Truman, in his own hand, crossed out those words and wrote in the state of Israel. Because he knew that there was more than one nation in that state. Even within the territory that was assigned by the United Nations under the partition resolution of 1948. You know, nearly half of the population were still Palestinians in that sliver of land, okay? So Truman was not going to sacrifice his, the relations of the U.S. State Department with the Arab peoples for the sake of declaring that Israel was a Jewish nation state. He crossed out those words. And yet it has come back. Now Netanyahu gets up before the General Assembly of the United Nations and says that we are the Jewish nation state. And therefore, you know, the Jewish people have self-determination, therefore you have to let Israel do whatever it wants. Basically, that's his simplistic argument. Israel was never recognized as a Jewish nation state by the United States of America. And yet Obama uses the same words as Netanyahu and calls Israel a Jewish nation state in order to please the Israeli government. 
and curry favor amongst a certain proportion of the Jewish population of Israel, about half, who are ideological like that, because they've been indoctrinated by the educational system. And on top of it all, they are conscripted into the military at the age of 16 for three years in the case of the boys, two years in the case of the girls, where they are further indoctrinated. Incredible. But there is resistance. Half of the conscripts refuse to go into military service and do some sort of community service work as conscientious objectors. Half. Yes, this is not known. Okay? Plus, there are resistors, refuseniks, as they are called. And there are a few who are completing repeated prison terms right now in prison in Israel for refusing military service to the state of Israel, who are Jewish but not Zionist. The Chsatmar, Orthodox, Hasidic community living in Jerusalem, because they want to live in Jerusalem and not in Israel, they refuse to allow their children to be conscripted into the military, which is now being proposed by the secular party of Lapid, who are in coalition with Netanyahu. They demonstrated in Israel of 500,000 men in Jerusalem saying, you will not take our children away from us. We will not allow you to take our children and indoctrinate them as Zionists in the military. And in New York at the same time, 50,000 Hasids were demonstrating. This was just the men, the women and children were at home. So you double that. If you want to include the women as well. This is a mass phenomenon. This Satmar community is so un-Zionist, they don't even vote in the Israeli elections together with half of the Palestinians who refuse to recognize the legitimacy of the Israeli elections, who don't vote in the Israeli elections either. So you have this, this double mass of, of populations who don't vote, who could have made the difference in terms of the composition of the current government. This current government has no legitimacy because they don't even represent the majority of the electorate, even in their coalition. So these are some of the things that you have to you strip away from the media representations, you know, to find out what's really going on. And this, this is, the, is the foundation of this misconception. Israel is not recognized as a Jewish nation state. It is recognized only as the state of Israel, which has a body of citizens who are composed of both the Jewish and Arabic character, who are called Palestinians. Now, at that time, what the U.S. State Department was proposing, which was dismissed by the Zionists, was the Morrison-Grady Plan, which was a uh, study done jointly by the U.S. State Department and by the uh, British uh, Foreign Office, which proposed to establish a federated Palestine with autonomous Jewish and Arab regions. Sounds very much like the Bundes proposal for national cultural autonomy. This was conceived of by a number of different uh, parties and writers and thinkers. It was obvious that you couldn't have a nation state imposed upon uh, an oriental territory such as Palestine. In the old countries such as the, exist in the Orient, you have multiple nations in each country. And yet the West comes in with the six Picot Treaty of uh, 1926 and says, oh, we're going to carve up the Middle East now between Britain and France, and this is going to be the British Mandate of Palestine. That's going to be uh, the French Lebanon uh, and French Syria and British Iraq uh, uh, and, and British uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, and later to be transplanted, you know, by the United States in place of the, the British Empire. So, you know, and none of these, you know, um, projects of state building, as they call it, have worked. Unless they have remained as a dictatorship, which is, uh, generally speaking, having a, a limited time span these days with the Arabic uh, revolutions, uh, you know, uh, bouncing from one country to another. So. The prospect of autonomous national formations living together in a pluralistic society 
is not that marginal as it would seem, just because it hasn't been mentioned by the proponents of the nation state of Israel doesn't mean that it has not been conceived of previously by various parties. And the fact that it was conceived of by various parties means that it has a certain logical coherency, that it makes sense to more than one person and to more than one point of view. In 1949, I have to embellish this point because Zionists will say to me, and they have, they said, oh, well, the Zionists, they didn't know what name they were going to call the country at the time. That's why it was called the Jewish state. And that's why they had to write it in by hand because they decided at the last moment that they were going to call it Israel. You know, like how, na you know, like how naive people can be. Okay, so if you follow through with this differentiation made here by Truman between the nation state of Israel and the state of Israel, in May 19, uh, 1949, we have a telex sent from Truman to Ben-Gurion. In connection with territorial matters, the position taken by Dr. Eaton, who was a, a spokesperson for the State of Israel, apparently, apparently contemplates not only the retention of all the territories now held under military occupation by Israel, which is clearly in excess of the partition boundary of November 29, 1947, but possibly an acquisition of further territory within Palestine. Very prescient. They knew what the Zionists were, uh, were about. But they insisted upon the legitimacy only of the UN partition resolution. And uh, the uh, 1948 boundaries of Israel, which went up to the Green Line, was not being recognized by the U.S. State Department here because only half of that territory was actually recognized by the United Nations in the partition resolution. Israel started a war of expulsion in 47 in order to gain as much territory as possible before they were going to be stopped by some force that was superior. The superior force were the Arab countries surrounding Palestine who sent in their troops to stop the further expansion of the Zionist militias. And that line became the Green Line, even though it was double the territory allocated by the United Nations. Then, the question of the Palestinian refugees who fled during the time of those uh, conflicts in 47-48. The U.S. State Department, in this telex, 1949, said to Ben-Gurion, representations to the Israeli government concerning the repatriation of refugees who fled from the conflict in Palestine. These representations were in conformity with the principles set forth in the resolution of the General Assembly of December 48 and urged the acceptance of the principle of substantial repatriation of the refugees, who now number 7 million, and still being housed substantially in refugee camps. And calls for the immediate beginnings of substantial repatriation on a reasonable scale Etc. Incredible. This is, you know, the same kind of rhetoric that we still hear, you know, from the U.S. government, without any impl implementation, without any resonance on the part of the various Israeli governments. Sorry, governments of Israel. Israeli and Israel are two different things. One is the population, the other is the state and its governing apparatus. The U.S. government does not, however, regard the present attitude of the Israeli, they call it the Israeli government, as being consistent with principles upon which the support of the U.S. government has been based. That's an utter condemnation of what Israel did in 48 with respect to the refugees. to take responsibility and positive actions concerning Palestinian refugees. And that far from supporting excessive Israeli claims to further territory within Palestine, the U.S. government believes it is necessary for Israel to offer territorial compensation for territory 
which it expects to acquire beyond boundaries of November 29th, 1947 resolution of the General Assembly. And we still hear the same thing again now in the various you know, proposals for a peace uh, settlement. Now, we have to talk about anti-Semitism because there is a confusion between the critique of an Israeli government, rather being the governments of Israel, and the Jewish people as a whole. First of all, a majority of the Jewish people don't even live in Israel. Secondly, majority of the Jewish people didn't even vote for the government of Israel. They have a plurality, not a majority. Thirdly, you have to differentiate between a state and civil society. This is a fundamental differentiation in political theory, political philosophy. States disappear, people do not. Nations exist in spite of states. Nations exist before states existed. States exist only as a political apparatus, a superstructure as it's called, imposed upon a given people at a given time, which lasts for a given period of, of, of uh, history as well. It does not endure. States change. Scotland was about to break away from Great Britain. Ireland already has. These states are artificial constructions. People are not artificial constructions. So you have to differentiate between a people and a state. Now, if in critiquing the governments of Israel or the Zionist ideology, a, a critic would confuse the two and base a critique of Zionism by attacking the Jewish people or what some call Jewishness, then that, I will say, is anti-Semitism and must be stopped. It is a populist, both right-wing and left-wing populist notion that has to be defeated if there is going to be any respect for a dialogue between the two peoples. Amongst the Palestinians, there is a general sort of recognition that there's a difference between the Israeli population and the State of Israel. However, the only Israelis they ever meet are Israeli soldiers from, from Israel. And the name used in Arabic, you know, for these soldiers is Yehudi, which means the Jews. This is a, a, a nomenclature that is imposed upon the political culture of the Palestinians by the uh, Islamic you know, religion, which considers that this is a conflict not between a state and the people, but between two religions. If it is framed in terms of a conflict between Islam and Judaism, then you have a problem there because all of a sudden the enemy becomes the people who follow the Judaic religion, even if they don't practice this religion anymore. I mean, the Jewish people are one of the least religious peoples in the world, you know, like 20%, you know, are, are practicing, you know, the religion. <laughs> and yet, you know, this is what is, you know, propagated, you know, by the mosques every Friday. And when I was living in uh, Nablus, Palestine, up on the side of the mountain, I was at about the same level as the loudspeakers from the minaret of the mosque that was just down below on the street. And this mosque was a uh, Hamas mosque. And for every Friday I would hear all sorts of diatribes about the Yehudi this, Yehudi that, you know. And it was quite obvious, you know, what was being propagated. So there is a misconception alongside of the populist misconceptions from the West. There is this misconception propagated amongst the Arabic and Palestinian populations, that this is a religious conflict, whereas it is not. Zionism was not a religious movement, even though it corresponds in principle with the Protestant reformist, you know, uh, movement, you know, for a nation state concept. Nonetheless, it took place so much longer after the Reformation that it had abandoned the religious characteristics and did not seek to propose, you know, a new kind of variant of the Judaic religion, but merely used it as a rationale in order to justify the establishment of a nation state per se. Now, BDS, boycott, 
disinvestment and sanctions is directed against Zionist institutions and Zionist uh, corporations who uh, most often you know, will seek to employ Palestinian labor in the West Bank at about uh, a fifth of the regular wages that are paid in Israel. The Palestinians are paid about, well, excuse me, uh, they're paid about $500 to do construction work to build colonies for the Zionists in the West Bank. It is the Palestinians who are building those, those settlements, those settlements so-called. It's the Palestinian labor that is building them for 500 shekels a month, okay? And why do they do that? Because any Palestinian job they can get only provides them with 200 shekels a month revenue. So they go and they work, you know, for some Zionist corporation, building a settlement there, which then pays people to go and live in those Silwan district of Jerusalem. They're actually paying Zionists to go and live in the houses because they don't have enough settlers who want to come and live in those houses even. But they're still building and taking over territory in order to expand as much as they can before some sort of settlement is imposed upon the governments of Israel. Now, BDS is a political response to this continual expansion and territorial aggrandizement of the Zionist governments of Israel. And it's an effective technique that is based upon the international support that is generalized now for the Palestinian people. Even amongst the American population, there is about a 50-50 split. In Canada, it was 50-50 split you know, a couple of years ago, but now after this gas war, there's more sympathy for the Palestinians than there is for the Israeli plight. The Israeli governments themselves count upon what they call a disproportionate response. So if there is some sort of an attack upon Israel in response to some kind of provocation, usually, that breaks a ceasefire that has been established, as has been established since the 2008 uh, battle and massacre of Gaza. Hamas kept a ceasefire agreement in operation, even though the Islamic Jihad broke it from time to time. And those uh, violations were used by Israel to attack uh, Gaza on a generalized basis in a disproportionate way. And Israel actually acknowledges that they're doing so in order to dissuade the Palestinians and any faction of the Palestinians from ever considering any form of resistance. Now, disproportionate response is illegal under international law. So, whereas the Israeli governments consider it to be acceptable, under international law it is not, and usually they're condemned you know, by the various human rights agencies and by the United Nations for having done so. Now, why does Israel and Zionism as an ideology consider that it has this, this right to disproportionate response, territorial engrandizement, expulsion of the Palestinian indigenous population, even though a substantial proportion of those Palestinians were originally Jewish and converted to being Islam three, four hundred years ago because, because they wanted to, because they avoided the tax as well, you know, because under the Ottoman Empire, if you are a national minority, you have to pay a special tax for the, protec for the protection of the state called um, a millet tax. Millet was national minority. So if you converted to being Islam, you didn't have to pay the tax. You could, um, your children could marry with a greater selection of, uh, of, uh, of other people. You know, there were certain benefits involved in that. Even though that Palestinian population who were Jewish retained certain Jewish characteristics and even engraved, sculpted the Jewish star above the entranceway in stone to their houses. And this can still be seen in the West Bank these days. Now, so how can the Zionists get away with, you know, this idea of dispossessing the Palestinians? Well, even though it was not a religious movement, even though the founders of Zionism were generally secular atheists, nonetheless, they rely upon Judaism as a rationale. That's why Zion, you know, has a religious connotation to it, you know, where the Temple Mount was, and why Zionism is called Zionism. Now, if you actually go into Judaism and look at the references to what are called the covenant with, with the deity between Abraham and the deity, which supposedly gives the title of deed, you know, to this territory, what do we find? we do not find what the Zionists claim, okay? Even though we're probably not 
very religiously inclined. Uh, I am not, you know, after the Holocaust experience, I cannot, uh, cannot understand the, the value uh, of, uh, of being a slave to, to a deity. That doesn't make any sense to me. And the question of whether or not a deity exists or, uh, or not is largely irrelevant to me, and I, I refuse to engage in such a debate. It's uh, not the question as far as I'm concerned. But if we do go into Judaism, we find a political history of a people. Not only one people, but of an entire sector of the Orient is contained in this history book called the Torah, which is an original book which I analyzed in my thesis as well, which was very difficult to get into my thesis. There were a lot of members of my jury who objected to having references to the Torah in a thesis in political philosophy. Why? Because you're only supposed to go back as far as 2,000 years to the Greeks, you know, in the foundation of Christianity. And then, anything before that doesn't exist anymore in Western universities. Even though there's a claim that Western political philosophy is based upon the principles, you know, enunciated by the Oriental, Oriental uh, uh, philosophies generated by Judaism uh, and subsequently Islam. Now, if we look at the quotations, actually contained in the Torah, that refer to this covenant, what do we find? And it says, And I will give to your seed, after you, the land of your sojourning, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their deity. Now, uh, possession in the uh, ancient sense did not mean, you know, possession in a uh, title deed sense, you know, in, in a bourgeois sense, you know, in which you had a, um, a title to a piece of land that belonged to you exclusively and to no other. Possession meant that you were given uh, recogni recognition for as an inhabitant of this land together with the other inhabitants of the land. And there's <coughs> other quotes that refer to the other inhabitants of the land of Canaan in equal measure to the uh, descendants of Abraham as well. That's also in the Torah. There's no doubt about that. Now, the thing that's crucial in this quotation, and this is the original quotation that refers to the covenant, is that it says, I will give to your seed. Now, even though it's in singular, your seed means all of your children, not just one. And in the Oriental tradition, the firstborn son of a patriarchal male is the inheritor of the title deed of what the father has to give as an inheritance. The firstborn son of Abraham was Ishmael, not Isaac. So Sarah got very upset <laughs> because she had, you know, given her servant, you know, Hajar, as a second wife to Abraham in the first place. So she felt like she was being undone here, you know, because she found out that she was going to have a son after all. So in order to make up for that, she insisted upon the matriarchal right of banishing the second wife from the household. However, that doesn't negate, you know, the inheritance, uh, the, the, the tradition of, you know, firstborn son, you know, having, you know, having such rights. But uh, in, the, in the mind of Sarah, yes, it did. So the, the matriarchal tradition in Judaism has very strong influence and has been used to concoct this ideology of Zionism in which uh, Isaac is now the principal inheritor of the heritage of Abraham in the name of the Jewish people. But how? How could it be in the name of the Jewish people? Because the Jewish people didn't exist until 500 years later with Moses. Okay, Abraham evidently was not Jewish. Neither was Noah. Abraham was not Jewish. He was a Semite originally from Iraq, what is now called Iraq, Mesopotamia. And he lived together with other Semites. They all lived together very happily. And he had an agreement with some of the uh, Semites that he lived there with to buy the cave in which he buried Sarah. And this agreement, you know, was a cordial agreement, you know, reciprocal, etc. And had no connotation of expulsing or removing the other population to make way for his descendants. They were to live together which was a tradition in the Orient, you know, from, from all of those ages. The Oriental peoples learned to live together until recently, due to Western intervention, we find the contrary. However, 
The original quotation refers to the seed of Abraham, all the seed of Abraham. Okay? Now, furthermore, there's a later reference to the covenant in the Torah, which seems to give an exclusive prerogative to this covenant to Jacob, who was named Israel. Okay. However, if we actually look into the original version of the Torah that is still retained by the Samaritan Jewish population living near Nablus in occupied Palestine and are using the original Samaritan text, we find a reference in a quotation which says, and my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Shara, Sarah, will bear to you sometime next year. Now, in the later text, which was edited by Ezra, there's one word that's changed in that quotation. Instead of saying, and my covenant I will establish with Isaac, it says, but my covenant will I establish with Isaac. The difference being, and is referring to Isaac as an inheritor of the covenant in addition to Ishmael, so that Isaac is not excluded. Okay, non-exclusion. But in the other quotation, when it says, but, that means that the inheritance of the covenant is being ascribed only to Isaac. And this was a modification introduced into the Torah by Ezra. And the original reference in the Samaritan text exists and is still being practiced by these Palestinian Jews living alongside the Palestinians of Nablus, up on top of the Gizra mountain there. And this has been further analyzed by uh, Harold Bloom and another uh, ac American academic in a published book called The the uh, J version. The J version is uh, referring to the original Samaritan text. And the entire text is printed there, and in that text it has this uh, quotation, which is non-exclusionary, and it has no references to uh, being ordered to uh, eradicate the population of Canaan to make place you know, for the Israelites returning from Egypt. There is no such reference. So the references to um, genocide introduced into the Torah by Ezra fit and are concluded by the erection of the ideology of Zionism. This superstructure was erected upon that particular nuance introduced by one word change. Incredible, but over a long period of time these things can happen. So I think uh, that's enough heavy material for your consideration, but I'd just like to conclude, you know, with a reference here. And in the uh, original telex that Truman sent to Ben-Gurion, he says, in conclusion, if the government of Israel continues to reject the basic principles of the resolution set forth by the General Assembly on December 11th, 1948, that's resolution 181, the partition resolution, and the friendly advice offered by the government of the United States for the sole purpose of facilitating genuine peace in Palestine, the U.S. government will be regretfully forced to the conclusion that a revision of its attitude towards Israel has become unavoidable. That's 1949. <laughs> and then still that revision of the United States orientation to the state of Israel has not been accomplished 65 years later. Until there was an announcement yesterday that Obama and the State Department are actually considering not invoking the veto power and security council when a resolution on Palestine is coming up in the, in the following months. This is the first time that any such indication has been given and may be the fulfillment of this threat made by Truman 65 years ago.
Thank you.